Hello, my name is Susan Fukushima, adult librarian for the Felipe de Neve branch of the Los Angeles Public Library. I'm joined today by Joy Yamaguchi, program coordinator from the Japanese American National Museum. We're here to introduce today's LA Made program, They Called Us Enemy, an intergenerational conversation on racial injustice. First of all, I wanna thank the National Endowment for the Humanities, our Library Foundation, and our behind the scenes staff for bringing the LA Made programs to you virtually. LA Made focuses on the diverse landscape of Los Angeles, highlighting the immense artistic and performance talent that has developed in the course of the city's eclectic history. This program is also part of the California Center for the Books Book to Action 2021, whose initiatives tackle important issues in the community and encourage reading, community discussion, and action, focusing on themes of equity, sustainability, and health. If you'd like to see more of our amazing LA Made programs, please visit our online calendar at lapl.org slash events. And for our LA Made programs, visit lapl.org slash LA Made. Our website also has blog posts that highlight the library's diverse resources and upcoming programs. Also, do not miss our next LA Made program, Thursday, April 22nd at 4 p.m., featuring a journey through Brazilian music. Sergio Melnyshenko, longtime radio host of the Brazilian Hour, presents a vibrant concert lecture with a trio of musicians, Silvia Nicolato, Roberto Montero, and Mika Mucci, that brings Brazil's diverse musical traditions to life. The event will be pre-recorded with a live question and answer. Now over to Joy, who will help introduce today's program. Hi, Susan. Thank you so much. My name is Joy Yamaguchi, as Susan mentioned, and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator at the Japanese American National Museum. And it's been such a pleasure partnering with LAPL and KYCC to bring together today's panel for the intergenerational conversation on racial justice and reconciliation surrounding George Takei's graphic memoir, They Call This Enemy. Um, before I introduce our panelists, I just wanted to let you know a little bit more about the Japanese American National Museum. We are based in Los Angeles's Little Tokyo and are committed to sharing the Japanese American experience in all of its complexity and diversity. Um, and we have been actually, even though we've had to have our physical doors closed for most of the last year, I've been staying connected virtually through our Janum from Home initiative that includes educational visits, events like this one, and workshops that bring all of our programming to your home. And we'll be continuing those programs through the upcoming year, including with our virtual gala on May 1st, but are also now open in a limited and COVID safe capacity to the public. So we really hope that you'll check out our website at Janum org to learn more about the museum and we hope to see you virtually or in person soon. And then so to start us off, we're going to hear a little bit from the author of this wonderful graphic memoir himself, George Takei, and this very special message. So over to George now. Hello, I'm George Takei and welcome to today's program hosted by the Japanese American National Museum in partnership with the Los Angeles Public Library System. And I am the author of this book titled, They Called Us Enemy. It's my graphic memoir of the time when I was a five-year-old boy imprisoned by our own government, the United States of America, in barbed wire prison camps simply because I'm of Japanese ancestry. All Japanese Americans on the West Coast Approximately 120,000 of us were imprisoned in barbed wire prison camps. It is a shameful, but a vitally important chapter of American history. There are le lessons to be taught by history, and it's very important that we know about it. And I'm delighted that you young people today are reading about it because you are going to be the adult Americans of tomorrow. I'm glad that you're going to know about this chapter of American history. They called us enemy, innocent people who had nothing to do with Pearl Harbor, being treated like criminals. They called us enemy. And 
it's also in Japanese. And you can get j the uh, Japanese version here at the Japanese American National Museum. But it's also translated into Spanish and Portuguese and German as well. So I, I want the people of the world to know this story of what happened to Japanese Americans d during World War II. Thanks again. Thank you so much, George. Um, George Takei has been a champion for the Japanese American National Museum since the very beginning, and we are so grateful for his support. And as he mentioned, um, it's really uh, wonderful that um, we're bringing this book to a young audience like we are today. Um, so during this program, we do want to let you know that you can email ecdept at lapl.org. And I think we'll be dropping that email in the chat. Um, if you're interested in an opportunity to receive a copy of the book, They Called Us Enemy. You can also visit the Janum store at janumstore.com to purchase a signed copy of the expanded English edition that has some extra resources or a new Japanese language edition. Um, or you can check out a copy from the LAPL at one of the library's to-go locations. So lots of really exciting ways, and we hope that you will um, get the book because uh, we think that so many more folks should be able to read it and learn about this experience. Um, and so on that, today we'll be learn hearing from June Burke, who is a former World War II incarcerate and also a Japanese American National Museum volunteer who will be in conversation with Abby and Abigail, two high school area um, two high school students from the Los Angeles area who are part of the Koreatown Youth and Community Center's Koreatown Storytelling Program. And that program is an intergenerational, multilingual and multi-ethnic oral history and digital media program that teaches ethnography and storytelling techniques to high school students and elders. KSP explores cultural practices, documents and archives, underrepresented narratives and investigates racial, economic, and health inequities in our Los Angeles community. And KSP is part of the Koreatown Youth and Community Center's intergenerational initiative. And you're really going to see that intergenerational element in our conversation today. So finally, I'm gonna give you a little bit more information on our wonderful, wonderful panelists and participants today. So first, Abby Hope Jihae Park is a freshman at Orange County School of the Arts in the Creative Writing Conservatory. She is published in literary magazines like Down in the Dirt and Plum Tree Tavern. She is also the magazine editor for Her Culture and the communications director for the Junebug Journal. Through KSP, she helps to discover and unearth the history of the Korean diaspora. Abigail Yoon is a high school senior at Laces who was born and raised in Koreatown. Being involved in KSP and her school's newspaper, Laces United, Yoon is um, keen to explore the intersection of journalism, ethnography, and oral history in order to shed light on marginalized issues and develop her worldviews outside her comfort zone. And finally, June Burke is a mother and grandmother of nine, and at age 10, she was evicted from her home in Hollywood and sent to Santa Anita Assembly Center and then Rower um, Ro Concentration Camp in Arkansas. After the camp closed, her family relocated to Denver, Colorado, where her family owned a confectionery store, and she worked as secretary to Min Minori Yasui, one of four lawyers who fought the legality of the exclusion order 9066 up to the Supreme Court. Before moving back to California, she worked as executive assistant to the first president of the Japanese American National Museum before retiring and becoming a volunteer. And as you can see, she's still active to this day. She also serves as a board member of the Tuna Canyon Detention Station Coalition. And I know that that was a lot of information because all of these folks have so much that they do, but we're gonna be hearing so much more from them soon. Um, and I want you to also note that there will be an audience Q&A at the end of the program. So you can use the chat on YouTube or Facebook to um, ask any questions you may have of our panelists or any questions you may have about the book and they will answer those at the end. Um, so now I would like to invite all three of them up to the screen and to take the reins for the conversation.
Hi, to Hi. begin, I just wanted to thank you, June, for joining us for this intergenerational <laughs> interview that we'll be having. Before anything, I wanted to go over the wordage that we'll be using for the rest of the event. There are many terminologies that are used when referring to the camps that thousands of Japanese Americans were sent to during World War II under President Franklin Roosevelt's Executive Order 9066. JANUM as an organization refers to these camps as concentration camps, whereas others may refer to them as internment camps. How do you personally, June, refer to these camps? I, I use the term um, concentration camp, and even the word camp kind of denotes the place that we had a summer camp where you have fun. So I like to say that we were in a concentration center. And instead of saying um, evacuation, I would rather, uh, in my own personal language, I say we were evicted from our homes. Evacuation to me sounds like you're escaping a flood or a fire. But in this case, we were being evicted from our homes that we lived in all our lives to be sent to a place where we didn't know how long we would be. And we were there for three and a half years. So that is a little bit more than just a camp experience. Okay, thank you. Um, you and George Takei were 10 years old and six years old respectively when you were in the concentration center. How did your parents explain to you what the concentration centers were? My parents were uh, very um, accepting of the situation. Um, and I think a lot of parents were, they didn't, want to frighten us, they didn't want to scare us, and they didn't want us to be upset. So they tried to make our life as normal as possible with uh, playing games and playing with our friends and growing up. So this is my family in front of our unit. That was my sister in the background. She was 18, getting ready to graduate from Belmont High School. And my brother to the left is Yas Aochi, and he was 16 and he was getting ready to play football for Belmont High School on the varsity team. Then that's my father uh, <clears throat> uh, at that time, I think he was about, uh, I can't remember, <laughs> uh, 65 maybe. And then my mother, uh, Kay, was right there next to him. And then that's me on the end. And I was, at that time, I was about 11 years old. So when I went into camp, I was 10, and I was 11, 12, and 13, and I came out when I was about 13 and a half. But that's our window, that's our doorway. Those are the black uh, tar papered barracks that we lived in, and we had the corner unit because we had a large family of five. My brother and sister soon left camp early because my sister was sponsored by a, um, American Friends Committee, which is a Quaker organization that found housing. And if you were accepted at a school, like she was accepted in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, to go to a beauty school, she could leave camp in care of a Quaker family. Um, my brother left early too. What is the most vivid memory you can recall of the center? Uh, I think it was Santa Anita where we were first taken from our homes. And if you imagine if you're living in a three bedroom home at, with a yard and you have your friends and you have your dog and, and uh, it's a normal life like any neighborhood. And then all of a sudden you're taken um, and put into a place with barbed wire around you, with guard towers around you. And then they tell you to pick up a sack and fill it with hay and they take you to a horse stable and then they say this is going to be your home uh, you take your you take your pillow and fill it with hay and that's going to be your mattress so for five months we lived in a horse stable and um, <clears throat> the smell was terrible naturally and my brother stayed out all day and he would only come home at night because the place smelled so bad and at night we had curfew at nine o'clock. They put out the lights and everybody had to be in bed and they had a bed check to make sure that everybody was in bed. 
Oh, well, that's my um, that's my sixth grade class in Brower concentration camp, and I'm there second from the top row, and those are my classmates, and I remember that we had a great teacher. We had uh, Miss Tabuchi as a Japanese uh, teacher, and then Miss Pisak as our uh, teacher then, and. I had uh, another teacher called Mrs. Miss Fox, and uh, she was a wonderful teacher too. We had very good teachers in camp and um, very kind to us. And I think that for me, it was a really good learning experience. You mentioned earlier that your parents did their best to make life at the concentration centers as fun and normal as possible. How do you think your perception of these concentration centers changed as you grew older? And how did this change in perception indicate? You know, I think there's a, a line in uh, that music, <clears throat> musical Les Mis that says, God will open your eyes when you're ready. And I think as a child, I saw camp from a child's view, and those are my memories. But when I grew older and I learned more facts about why we were sent and the prejudice and the hate that sent us there, then I grew uh, very upset that, uh, that hate could play such a big part in somebody's life to a point where they say, we have to get rid of all of these people we have to get rid of them out of California, Oregon, and Washington. And it was based on race, and it was based on hate. And that was the only reason that we were evicted. So I, I from, a, from a child's point of view, I had a lot of fun in camp because my parents never made me feel frightened. They made my life as normal as possible. But it's only as I got older and I learned the facts of why we were evicted that it made me very, very upset that um, American citizens could lose their civil rights like that. Thank you for that answer. That was very eye-opening. To continue and referring back to George Takei's graphic memoir, did you experience a similar concentration center experience as George did in the centers, or how do you feel about that? Um, well, George was, I think, four years old and I was 10. He's about six years younger than I am. Um, and so I think for a child, it's probably very frightening to be in a whole new uh, experience. But I think when you're 10, 11, and 12, all you want to do is play with your friends. And so my uh, memory of camp was, uh, I still remember the friends that I made in camp and I'm very, sometimes, and some friends I'm still very close to. Um, I miss the people that I met. And I think the memories of our friendship and our fun times in camp has kept me, oh, I don't know. I feel so um, nostalgic and, um, warm in my memories of remembering my friends in camp. That was our block. <clears throat> I would lived in block 14. Um, to the left is the barracks that we lived in. Uh, there are six barracks to each block. And then the, the middle um, building on the right is called our mess hall. Everything was army terms, mess hall, latrine, barracks. So at the mess hall, you had to eat at a certain time. And they would ring a bell or gong, and you had to stand in line. And it was cafeteria style that you walk in, pick up a tray, and go down a cafeteria line. And then you eat at picnic tables. Um, and so we ate mostly with our friends. We, we didn't eat too much with our family which kind of broke up the family unit because in the Japanese household I, and maybe even in Korean households, um, the older generation, you had to, the father sits down first at the dinner table 
and he gets fed. And then the children sit down and they get fed. And the mother is the last one to sit down and she eats whatever is left. So that is a normal household in a Japanese family. But when we went to camp, that didn't happen anymore. The kids ate with their friends. My brother ate with his friends. My sister ate with her friends. And so the family table um, custom was not there anymore for families. Um, comparing your concentration center experience with George Takei's, do you think that the concentration centers were accurately portrayed in the book? Yes, uh, George, I remember George saying to me once um, that he came, we had performances in camp. They allowed us to have Japanese performances in camp to keep the morale up of the um, older generation, the Issei. So we used to perform a Japanese dance and Japanese plays. And George says he was there at one of our performances when he peeked under the curtain and he saw all of us performing. And he says that's when he first got started thinking about stage and acting. And so I thought that was a neat connection that uh, we made there for the children. And now here he is, a very famous actor. And uh, so it's, it, it kind of, I get a kick out of thinking that he first saw us in a concentration camp center. <laughs> yeah, I think that's super interesting how, despite how the concentration centers disrupted the regular lives of so many Japanese Americans across our nation, there was still some things that came out of it that we need to think of as a silver lining, I guess. Yes, I think you're right. Like uh, myself, I have five children. I have eight grandchildren. My sister got married to a young man that she met in camp and lived in Michigan and raised her family in Michigan. Uh, she has, uh, she had um, uh, two, three children and two great, not great, uh, wonderful grandchildren who grew up in Michigan. So, you know, the, it out of the ashes, beautiful lives were formed. And it's like that saying, the phoenix rises, the phoenix rising out of the ashes. I think that a lot of uh, wonderful things came out of camp. And, and I'm, I am very grateful today for uh, my husband, my family, my children and my grandchildren. Um, and so I, I feel very grateful for my camp experience. Thank you for that. Um, continuing on and referring to the book, George Takei expressed a lot of anger and rage towards the incarcerated generation for not trying to stop their incarceration experience. And so, did you have a similar emotional experience with George as well? Did you ever feel this rage and injustice about what happened to you and your family? Uh, not when I was a child, uh, because, you know, our parents were very law abiding. My father came over from Japan in 1899 and he worked on the railroads. He worked very hard all his life. And there was prejudice against Asians from eight from the early 18, 1820s when they brought the Chinese over as uh, slave laborers to work on the railroads. So they stopped the Chinese from coming over with the Chinese Exclusion Act. And then they brought the Japanese over. And my father was in that group of laborers that came over to build uh, railroad tracks. So, um, but then they, there was a terrible, um, prejudice against all Asians. And so it was very hard for, they couldn't own land. Uh, there were laws against owning any land. And um, um, there were different laws that prevented them from um, becoming economically um, successful. But in spite of that, they kept working hard. So when they went to camp, it, you know, they just accepted it as this is part of it. This is part of our experience here in, in um, the United States. 
and as much as they love their country, it's um, being at war with Japan was very painful for them because how do you choose between a country where your parents are, where you were born and your parents are still living and a country where your children are born and you want the children to grow up in America. So they, they had this very struggle of trying to uh, be, you know, they loved their parents in Japan. They loved their brothers and sisters in Japan. And yet they had children born here in America. So it was, it, I could, I could feel their struggle um, for a lot of people. So I think that um, maybe some of them had a lot of rage. I didn't see that personally in my family. Um, we were always, my, my father was a very strong uh, believer of being grateful for everything you have every day. So I think that kind of rubbed off on all of us that, you know, we just need to be grateful for everything that we have every day. In um, George Takei's book, he also mentioned the questionnaire. How is your experience similar or different to his? Yes, that, that's the same questionnaire that um, I felt so sorry for a lot of people. A lot of, of the Issei's, like I said, still had parents in Japan. And <clears throat> as the oldest son, they felt a very strong duty to go back to Japan to take care of their parents. But yet, you know, the children wanted to stay here in America. And again, like I said, how do you choose between a mother and a father? How do you choose between a parent and a child? They had these personal struggles. And so some of them went back to Japan because they had to take care of their elderly parents. And, um, and I think that um, some people say they were disloyal. I don't think that they were disloyal. I think they just had this uh, conflict of trying to choose between do I take care of my parents or do I stay here and take care of my kids? And the questionnaire said, do you give up all allegiance to the Japanese government? Well, again, that's the government where you were born and that's the government where your parents are. So how do you choose between a parent and a child? And they, uh, most of them, said, I'm going to stay here in America with my children because this is, and, and a lot of parents even said to their sons, when fathers were being taken away from their families and sent to Tuna Canyon, the fathers said to their sons, and I have this on record on tape, um, I'm here behind barbed wire because I was born in Japan, but you, you were born here in America. So you go fight for your own country. And they urged their sons to sign up to fight uh, for America. And my brother was in, my oldest brother, Tom, was in the 442. And, and his, his, what he said to my mother was, I'm going to fight so that we can prove we're um, loyal Americans and um, he was one of the lucky ones to come home, fortunately. Uh, so many gave up their lives. And so when I saw, I'm, I'm digressing, but when I saw January 6th happen and people storming the Capitol, that really enraged me. That really made me so sad to think that all this time, all these soldiers, all these Americans, um, Black, Indian, um, Mexican-Americans, uh, indigenous people all fought alongside with everybody to um, protect democracy in America. And here they're trying to, you have these fascist groups type people um, trying to say that they're gonna save democracy, which is we, we've already need, we already have democracy here. Thank you. That was extremely insightful. And I'm glad you touched on some global issues as well, because that's, I think that's really important. 
So moving on, in the Koreatown Storytelling Program, we recently had a discussion about the American dream and what that means to immigrants. And so thinking about the American dream and the government's right to protect the people's right to freedom, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, how do you personally feel like the concentration centers have affected your perception of the American dream and what it means to be American? You know, if one person's rights are taken away or endangered, that means all of our rights are being endangered. And that's not from me. That's from Min Yasui, who I work for. And he spent, uh, I think, like 16 months in solitary confinement for standing up to the government saying, you cannot put curfew on American people. He lost his case and he was sent to solitary confinement for 16 months in, in, in jail in Oregon. But he, he said, I have to do this. I have to fight because we have to speak up when something wrong is happening. Oh, that's the picture of my last scene of leaving Roar uh, from behind the truck. We were leaving camp for the last time. It took, somebody took a picture, I guess, and gave it to me. And um, I was very sad to leave camp because, you know, all my friends were there and we were on our way to Denver, Colorado, where I knew no one. And my family didn't. We had one family who was willing to take care of us, so we went to Denver. And the West Coast was still close to us, Japanese at that time. So people had to relocate where they had sponsors or they had somebody to say, we will take care of you. So that's why my parents went to join their family, friends in Denver, Colorado, who uh, gave us a place to live and my parents worked for them as janitors um, and um, I washed dishes <laughs> for room and board at a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> and uh, that was my first job. Thank you for that. Um, I also had one last question about your in, about your concentration center experience. On the inside of the book, They Call This Enemy, uh, George Takei asks the following questions. What does it mean to be American and who gets to, to decide? What are your thoughts on these questions? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear the question too well. What did you say? The two questions are, what does it mean to be American and who gets to decide? Um, oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I've always thought of myself because I'm born here that I'm an American, uh, but my heritage being Japanese, I'm very proud and I enjoy Japanese arts and culture. So I like to uh, spread that too. And um, I don't think no one else can decide for me if I'm an American or if I'm not. Um, I think I agree with George Takei in that um, no one, I mean, we're all born here. If we're born here, we're Americans. Thank you. It was really interesting being, being able to listen to your experience in the Japanese concentration uh, centers. Thank you so much for your amazing, insightful input. Thank you. I just wanted to ask you a question, both of you. You're both interested in um, civil rights and you seem very interested. How, what made you first get interested and pursue um, this project? Well, um, personally for me, being the daughter of two immigrants as well, I understand what it is like to be a part of a marginalized community. Um, growing up, I always saw my parents work all the time and I understand how hard it could be to make a life for themselves and their children in America when they were aliens, right? And so seeing my parents work so hard, I just thought that I had to do something to kind of, you know, improve and create positive change in the society that we have because 
that's there's so many things that we can work on and as american citizens we have the right to do so right that's that's why this is a democracy because we have our rights to use and create change which is why i'm super interested in just really shedding light on marginalized communities which is also a big reason of why i joined the koreatown storytelling program because there's so many stories that need to be heard in los angeles and i just thought it was a really necessary thing to do that's great how about you? yeah for for me, both my parents are also immigrants. And I think when you're an immigrant, you feel like you have to prove yourself um, and you have to prove your citizenship. My dad's actually from Paraguay and he immigrated to America when he was in high school and my mom's from Korea. And um, the reason why I wanted to do this event is because I wanted to be able to share stories of uh, Paraguay, like, um, of the cross of different cultures, especially because I grew up listening to stories of my dad growing up in really um, poor areas of Paraguay and my mom growing up in America as a Korean American. So I joined the Korea Storytelling Program because my mom's dad, my grandpa, he worked in the garment industry and my dad's mom, my grandma worked, um, she had her own watch business. So for me, it was really important to share the stories of these business owners, immigrants, people coming from all across the world um, to come to America for um, to fulfill the American dream. And I thought that this was a great way for me to explore that, explore my own culture, my history, um, and my family. I think that's great. I, I really am happy that you both find um, so much pleasure in learning about your immigrant parents or grandparents. I think that I, I'm like you, when you think about your parents working so hard or your grandparents working so hard as immigrants, you feel, I mean, I feel a sense of, of uh, such gratefulness for them that what they went through. And I think that they endured so much for us so that we can have a better life. And so I'm like you that, um, you know, the more, the more we can pay back, it's sort of like honoring uh, our our immigrant uh, parents and grandparents. Uh, that's how I feel too. So I'm glad that you both feel that way. I think that's great. And I really wish you the best in your um, studies, um, like at the Orange uh, County School of Arts where you're studying uh, writing and you're, leadership in your young community is really meaningful because we really need young leaders who are very passionate about uh, your immigrant experience. I think it's very precious. Thank you. I like to keep up with you guys. <laughs> I like to hear more about you as you go along. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's super interesting that we can just have the two perceptions of two different generations. It's, it's just really cool to me. Um, continuing on, I thought we can go over some current global questions and see what your thoughts are on those. And so speaking on the topic of immigration, at the end of the graphic memoir, George Tepke mentions the court case of Trump versus Hawaii which was the ruling that upheld Trump's immigration ban on Muslim countries. And so in our current new era with President Joe Biden, Mr. Biden has a policy where all unaccompanied minors who cross the southern border are allowed to stay in the United States. And so there has been a record surge of unaccompanied minors in the United States from the southern border. And so Moving forward as a nation, how do you feel like we should address the issue of immigration? I know that the Japanese American community is a champion for protecting the rights of these unaccompanied minors and from the separation that they're facing from their parents. So what are your thoughts on that? I feel that 
for those children to make that long journey, for the parents to give up their children so that they can come to a better country for a better life. I feel they, it must have been so painful for them to make that decision. I hope that we can help them. I hope they can find homes here. I hope they can find somebody <clears throat> to help and guide them here while they when they come here. Because that's why our parents came too, because they wanted a better life uh, than what they had in the old country. So um, I, I'm very much for it. You know, um, speaking of being separated from your parents, before EO 9066, there was this proclamation 2525, 2526, and 2527. And that was the three proclamations made by the president. And one was for taking fathers away from their children who were Japanese leaders. They had, the other one was for German parents. And one was for Italian parents because they were all considered foreign enemy aliens, quote, quote, enemy aliens. They had no proof. And yet, be, just because they were leaders in their community, they were taken away from their children and placed in a, in, in a Department of Justice camp. So that's where Tuna Canyon comes into my life. We are studying about these people who were taken away from their children. So our pain is with separation of families that we think that's a that's an inhuman that's inhuman to separate parents from children so the immigration per, uh, problems that we are having now stem back from that and i think there is a, <clears throat> a congresswoman in michigan who's trying to get that law off the books because you cannot, even when they talk about separating or um, imprisoning Muslims now, it, it's the same same law that took away the Japanese, the German, and Italian parents. Some mothers, mostly fathers, but even some mothers, took them away from their children. Um, I, it, it's just in, inhumane to do that. It's not a civil right. It's a inhuman action so i'm very much um against any kind of imprisonment of children thank you um also since the beginning of the COVID 19 pandemic many asian americans have been scapegoated and intentionally targeted for the virus there have been 3,800 plus documented crimes over the course of the past year according to the reporting form stop aapi hate what are your thoughts on the recent rise of AAPI hate crimes? I think a lot of Asian, um, I think we're guilty of not reporting incidents. We're not used to going to the police to tell them of any kind, kind of crime. We, we tend to keep it to ourselves. And I think there's a program called In the Visible. We're, vi we're invisible because we don't speak out. We need, if something happens to us and it's wrong, we need to report it. Um, and that goes for me too. I, I am scared to report any kind of altercation or something that has happened to me um, simply because I says, oh no, it's not important, you know. Um, but it is, it's, it's the cumulative effect of all of us reporting everything because unless people know, then people are not educated as to what we're going through. So I'm, uh, I hope people will s speak up more, including myself. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I feel like a large component of the Asian American experience is feeling like you can't speak out or just feeling like you won't have your voice heard, which is why we just don't do it anyways. And that's definitely something that as a collective, we do need to work on. Yeah, I think we, yeah. we, hide, we hide behind our, uh, oh no, we don't want to cause any problems. We don't want to um, make anybody worried about us. So we just say, oh no, you know, this didn't really 
uh, it, it happened, but it doesn't matter, you know, but it does matter because it, it, it just one person being hurt hurts everybody. So I'm glad you both feel very strongly about your leadership position that you have in your community. And um, I, I hope we can uh, get people to speak out more. I agree. Again, June, I want to thank you so much for answering our questions. You gave so many insightful and perceptive answers and just hearing about your experiences in the concentration centers and just your thoughts on global issues as well. It was just so good to hear. So now we'd like to turn over um, to the audience who have questions. So if the audience would like to ask you any questions, I think there's um, one Stephanie. Yeah, so the first question is from Stephanie. She says, thank you, June, for sharing your story. I would like to know, why do you think American education has excluded this from regular curriculum? They have done this to all minorities. And what do you think we should do to make these stories more mainstream? Yes, well, when I came out of camp, I was in junior high school and I went to my first class and the girls asked me, Oh, what school did you go to? And I said, well, I went to school in camp and I was in camp for the last, and they would think that I went to some kind of summer camp. They had no clue. They had heard nothing about us being in concentration camps. And, and that has happened and that has persisted through the years. Sometimes people won't know about it until they meet somebody from a camp or they're in high school and they, maybe they have one chapter about it. So we, I guess we have to just keep talking about it and explaining and getting it out there so that people will know not only um, experiences of Japanese immigrants and Japanese people, but I think all immigrant families are facing the same kind of problems and feel that they are being not heard or not seen. And I think we need to speak out more and, and you know, take advantage of programs like this that help us to uh, talk about it intergenerationally or among our friends, among our, our peers. Yeah, I definitely think that these um, conversations are really important. Um, so that we can continue to learn and grow. Thank you. Well, we have another question from Willa Lim. So June, were you able to talk to your parents about how they felt about being incarcerated after leaving these centers? I'm, my parents, um, well, back in uh, the old days, my parents spoke Japanese and I spoke English. So there wasn't too much uh, conversations of very meaningful projects. They, they could tell me, do this, do that, you know, go to school, come home early. It was all instructional, but we never sat down to have real conversations. And my father was a good storyteller, so he would tell us stories. But most Japanese families, we had this um, first and second generation um, wall of language because we would speak English at school and to our friends. And the only time we spoke Spanish, uh, not Spanish, we, only time we spoke Japanese was at our home. And if our parents didn't understand English, it was hard to explain what's going on at school, um, how I feel about things. And it was hard for them to explain to us how they felt about things. So um, maybe, each generation will get closer and closer as you're able to talk to your parents about um, things in common in a common language. And that common language might be uh, the language of your heritage or it might be in English. Um, we were, I think we were kind of taught at, when the war broke out that we shouldn't be speaking any more Japanese. They cut out Japanese schools. so. Um, we stopped learning Japanese at that age. So uh, we sound more retarded when we try to speak Japanese. And, and uh, 
the person that comes from Japan now is very fluent in Japanese and English. So they, they, uh, they can speak much better than we can. Um, our next audience question is from Maria. She says, other than They Call This Enemy, is there another book you could recommend to share this part of history to younger readers? Yes, I think there's another memoir um, book uh, called Displacement. And I found that one very interesting also to read. <clears throat> uh, and she goes even further into the um, discrimination of all more more than just Japanese um, families. So I would recommend Displacement. That's a good book. But there are other good books. Um, there's a story of um, uh, Ralph Lazo, who was a Mexican-American boy going to Belmont High School before World War II. And when his friends were taken into camp, he also decided to go with his friends and follow them into Manzanar. And that story is in a film and a documentary. And he stayed in camp for a while and then he, he volunteered for the army and served in the army. He came home and he became, I think, a teacher. Um, so his life is very interesting. So there, there are stories of real life people that once lived the experience. And I think that's a great place to start learning about people and their experiences. So the next audience question is from Stephanie. Did your family bunkers have telephones? Wondering how you were able to reach out to friends and family for sponsorship. Uh, no, the sponsorship was sponsored by the people at camp. You would say, I want to go to Minnesota, or I want to go to school in Missouri, or I want to go to school in New York. And then the American Quaker, uh, American Friends Committee, which was a Quaker organization, would try to find a family who would be willing to sponsor a person. And they would work through the uh, camp um headquarters and you would apply and they would try to family to sponsor you and that was the way that uh, a lot of young people were able to leave camp and go to colleges or get jobs outside of camp yeah. our next audience question is from koopa um, or koopa are there any particular civil rights histories that inspire you especially Yes, I think my favorite one is the story of Min Yasui, uh, who I work for, and um, his story of standing up and trying to find a policeman to arrest him because he's out on curfew, beyond curfew hours, and his experience of, of um, going to prison. Uh, and later on, he became a great civil rights leader because of his passion not only for the Japanese, but for all, all groups, all races. He, he became um, the inter-community relations director in Denver, Colorado. And it was, it was <clears throat> an organization that protected not only Japanese, but fought for the rights of, of, of uh, the Mexican Americans, the African Americans, um, the indigenous, indigenous people. So yes, he's, I think he's my hero. And you, and his, he, they've got a movie out about him too called um, Never Again. If you get a chance to see that documentary, I think it's, you could see it online. It's, he's a very, very wonderful speaker and um, showed a lot of courage for what he did. Thank you for that. I've never heard of him before I spoke to you, so that's very enlightening. I'll definitely check it out. To continue, we have an audience question from Diane. 
How do you feel about recent news of those finding artifacts from the Japanese concentration centers and selling them instead of giving them to the museums? Yes, I guess I'm against um, also profiting from um, a personal painful experience, whether it's from a Holocaust survivor or whether it's an indigenous, indigenous tribe. I think all those things belong to everybody and it's not for the profit or sale to people. I think that um, really dehumanizes people by making it into a selling object. So I would encourage people to give it to museums instead of trying to sell it online or eBay or things like that, uh, auctions. Um, because the museums are the best places that tell stories like the Japanese American National Museum, they have a collection of, of artifacts that were made in camp. And um, uh, I think they are the best people to tell the stories. Thank you so much for answering all of our questions. Um, it was really amazing being able to hear from you and learn, um, learn about the internment camps. Thank you. I really enjoyed talking also to Abigail. And, that. and so I think that um, I'm really encouraged that young people are interested and are um, speaking out. So I hope you continue. I hope you, I wish you the best of luck in your pursuit in your, um, and further in your pursuit too through colleges and different um, avenues, whether it's art or education i think it's great i just really applaud you and i'm very proud of you thank you so much yeah thank you it was, it was a great opportunity to speak with you today thank you thank you Sam, susan thank you june abigail and abby that was a wonderful, enlightening conversation. And thank you everyone so much for joining us for today's LA Made program. Remember to check out the library's online calendar at lapl.org. We hope you will all join us again Thursday, April 22nd at 4 p.m. for LA Made's program, A Journey Through Brazilian Music. Also, if you could fill out two audience surveys, we will provide the links in the chat. For the event name, please put Koreatown Storytelling Program. This is for a grant they received from the California Humanities, as well as a survey for Book to Action 2021. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>